number one thing when my coaching clients come to me and they say, Adam, I hate myself. I hate my life. I think that I am unworthy of love. I just don't respect myself in any way, shape, or form. I set them down, and here's the biggest impact I see right here. Adam Lane Smith is an attachment specialist with over 450,000 followers across his social media platforms. The biggest piece of that work that I have found, half of it, is just even believing that there's a different way to live. Even hearing about attachment, even hearing about relationships, even hearing you can change, you don't have to feel and believe this forever. When you do this, it's incredible how fast your self-esteem can turn around. All right, welcome back to the Better Human Podcast. What is going on? We have an amazing guest today, Adam. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Greg. Looking forward to this one. Yes, it is. Well, listen, Adam Lane Smith, ladies and gentlemen, is an attachment specialist with over 450,000 followers across his social media platforms. He does a lot of consulting internationally with CEOs, investors, entrepreneurs, exec executives, military veterans, which I think is a very important um, <clears throat> group to work with. He's also appeared on a ton of different podcasts, right? And talking a lot about generational attachment issues, recovering from trauma, and raising global awareness of attachment. So we're going to wrap today about this whole concept of attachments. And for the audience, Adam, let's just jump right into it. Tell me what is an attachment specialist for the audience and break down the whole concept and framework for us. Let's make this really easy and really simple. Attachment is the skill set and the beliefs about relationships that we form in childhood that helps us get our needs met and helps us stay safe and feel safe. In the first couple of years, you learn if other people are going to be warm and loving and supportive, if they're going to listen to you, they're going to push you away, they're going to dismiss you, they'll abandon you, and you form core beliefs about relationships for the rest of your life. Then you build a skill set to adapt to those core beliefs, whether they're real for the rest of the planet or not, they were real for your family and you hold on to them forever. I came into this work as a licensed marriage and family therapist for many, many years. I specialized in trauma and the way that that shaped relationships. But what I started seeing was that under all of the diagnoses that are out there, was this layer called attachment that nobody else was talking about, that other therapists, most of them had never heard about. So I dove in deep to become a specialist in this area. I now specialize all over the world, work with families, couples, also executives, teams, everybody who needs to fix their skill set and their beliefs about relationships. All right. So you hear a lot about childhood trauma. Like, I think it's a big thing that people are using as a, as maybe even a badge of honor now, right? I, I talk a lot about this, which is, I think the danger in the world of mental health today is that people are running around with the badge of honor of anxiety. I have anxiety. I have childhood trauma. I have this. Maybe in some, capac uh, some capacity, it's, it's almost a, uh, it's an excuse to continue with this sort of bad behavior. So let's break down a little bit for the audience, the, the whole concept of, or the whole background of childhood trauma and what affects us as kids when it comes down to this concept of attachment, like positive and negative, right? So like, what would be some of my experiences as a child that would um, have me end up with sort of this negative in quotations attachments or positive attachments? Is that Am I framing Absolutely. that correctly? Secure and insecure is the words that we use. You're very Perfect. close. Perfect. Secure so and insecure. So secure attachment, there's four attachment styles. Secure attachment is the one we're aiming for. I got five kids of my own. I teach all kinds of parenting. So attachment in childhood forms when you work with your child. You teach them that others will be generally fair with them. Others will listen to them. Others will resolve conflicts with them. So they can open up and be honest about what's happening. And then other people will work with them on it. It's not about being perfect. It's about building a system so that they they believe they can work with other people and that they deserve respect. Those are the core pieces you need for secure attachment. Unfortunately, the research now shows that about 50% of American adults and, and also over in Europe have insecure attachment. They did not learn this in childhood. Divorce can do this. Children in daycare way too early and way too long can do this. Yes, abuse. Yes, neglect. All kinds of issues in childhood can teach you that you don't deserve love. That's anxious attachment style. You have something wrong with you that everyone else can see and they will abandon you for. You have imposter syndrome. You're a fraud. You have to try to earn approval. You're terrified of abandonment or you believe that other people are unreliable, especially during times of stress, that nobody else will ever be fair with you. They will cross your boundaries. You have to maintain a wall and avoid connection with other people. This is avoidant attachment style. And if it gets bad enough, you may develop both of those issues and have disorganized attachment style, the combo of both very chaotic. You don't like yourself. You don't like others. You are endlessly running away from connection over and over and over. Those are the ways that happens. But then... 
you grow up into adulthood. It doesn't just go away. It gets worse. You start layering in issues as you grow into adulthood, all your relationship disappointments, all your romantic problems. Maybe you get married. Maybe you start a career. Maybe you start a business. You try to be a leader. You do anything out there, but that's your core belief about the world and about others and about yourself. And you have a skill set to match it because when you have insecure attachment, you don't get the skills to work with other people collaboratively. You learn the skills to work around other people, either by approval seeking or by manipulating or micromanaging managing or dodging everything and you do not have the skills you need to succeed as an adult and how common is this i mean in in, in adults like the, is there uh, is there an average amount of the population that end up with these these severe i'm going to use the word severe attachment uh issues Absolutely. So as I said, the research says it's about 50% for insecure, but the double, the double attachment issues fully disorganized, that's about two to 5%. Now the extreme versions of this are the personality disorders that we hear so much about borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. That last one, they tend to end up either as criminals or as politicians, which is fascinating. But personality disorders also form out of this when you truly believe no one is ever going to give you the care you need. So it takes over your whole personality. Man, it's almost describing what the world's turned into today. I mean, there is a massive sort of rejection or hesitancy to get into relationships, right? Yes. Um, and, um, you know, the you're seeing marriages uh, not just end, but people are not getting married anymore. People are not having kids anymore. It's like right. there's, a, there's, a, there's a strain on relationships. You come from marriage therapy and stuff. I mean, what... What what allows for a successful marriage? I know it's not things. a simple answer, but what would be some things that like you know contribute to me having? Let's let's change the word successful to a healthy relationship, whether with a partner, a marriage, a business uh, partnership. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's it's funny that marriage and business partnership as co-founders, those two are the only things in the world that overlap exactly in that way. Because marriage throughout history has been the business of building a family. So marrying and co-founding together, same, same skill set. It's amazing. The same skills that make you a great co-founder also make you a great partner in marriage couple of things. Number one is communication skills, to be able to articulate your needs, your thoughts, your desires, fires that are happening in various departments, issues that are going on, the ability to communicate like that. Okay. Number one. Number two is conflict resolution. The belief that you can resolve conflict with others, the belief they will resolve conflict with you, and then the skill set to be able to navigate that conflict. Conflict, people think it's a dirty word. It can be as simple as, hey, what do you need this week? How can I help you? <gasps> It's a conflict to step in and ask something from the other person, but to be able to navigate that up to bigger conflicts. Hey, what do you like in bed? Hey, what do you need from me this week to succeed at, at this job? Hey, what do you need as your partner for us to be, build a loving partnership and a loving marriage forever? To be able to have those conversations, conflict resolution skills. And then number three, it, it's, it's dependent. The other two are really dependent on this is that secure attachment. You must have secure attachment together as a partnership. I have seen time and time again, not only co-founder relationships with businesses I've worked with, but also with marriages extensively I've worked with throughout the years. If you have attachment issues in one or both partners and it's not resolved, it frequently, frequently leads to divorce. In fact, I never saw a divorce happen that didn't have at least one attachment issue involved. Every divorce has attachment issues. So what do you do? Like, let's say you have secure attachments and your partner doesn't. I mean, how do you navigate those waters? So it depends. It depends if you're the anxiously attached person who's seeking uh, reassurance, but you've healed that and you've become secure. There's probably a reason that you have connected with a partner who has insecure attachment. You usually attract those people because your skill sets are complementary, but your behaviors are also complementary. If you are a secure person who's connected with an insecure partner, the number one biggest thing you need to do first is get them aware that attachment exists because they are functioning in that state purely because they don't believe there's a safer way to function. They don't believe they will be loved, so they're say, they're endlessly trying to start, seek approval. They will never state their needs openly. We call this nice guy syndrome. I've worked with Dr. Robert Glover and talked with him about this extensively. Nice guy syndrome is anxious attachment style. Or they don't believe you will ever be fair with them. 
and they want you and they connect with you, but they also don't trust you and they never ever will because they innately cannot trust people. So you need to get them aware that attachment even exists. I have programs for this. I have all kinds of help for that. Can this happen because of, uh, in quotations, overparenting? You love too much. You're, you're, you're overparented. I mean, we, that's the joke about sort of the millennials today, right? Which is this, this, this overcompensation of parenting. There was no discipline, right? There was just this extensive or uh, not extensive, excessive nurturance and excessive love. Mm -hmm. You're on the right track. Uh, it's not the amount of love that's the problem. It's something called permissive parenting. And it usually is drawn from anxiously attached parents, so often the mother, who said, your dad is awful. He's disconnected from all of us. He's avoidant, but I'm the good one. I'm going to earn your love and approval as the good parent and overtake and take care of you, but be endlessly nervous and afraid and worried. And everything I do is a worried skill set. The kids don't learn healthier skill sets from anybody because nobody in the family has a healthier communication skill set. They just learn how to be nervous and anxious like mom. Then they go out and they have that same skill set. They also feel rejected by dad. Now they have a bad skill set, bad self-esteem, bad views of other people. It looks like, quote unquote, too much love. But what it is, is that permissive parenting from approval seeking. Yeah, I've seen it happen. I know friends or not friends, people in the community, I see it. You know, you see the parent one, which is this excessively anxious, intense type of human being. And, you know, I see, you sit back and, and it's hard not to judge it. It's hard not to, to have an opinion, which is like, in quotations, you're fucking up your kid. Right. And, 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 and there, there, there's blinders on with this stuff. Have you ever heard the concept of the Imago theory? Cause you were talking a little bit about, uh, communication and conflict resolution. Before. I have. Absolutely. What do you think of it? So the Imago theory is an excellent concept, which talks for the audience talks about the stages of your relationship. Right. And very simply, when we're born, we're born a perfect human being. We've, let's call it, uh, this, if you imagine a circle and as we're raised through our formative years, our parents spit our personality in half. Right. We end up becoming more to the one versus uh, one side versus the other side. And the joke about that is you grow up and you meet your other half. This is opposites attract. And that's what you fall in love with. And what creates the power struggle, which is the next stage of the relationship, talks about how basically what you are attracted to and what you fall in love with and what you need is the other half. The opposite is the exact thing that creates the, the, the tension, the conflict, the struggle, right? And there's, we'll save it for the audience, but there's a number of, there's five very distinct stages that happen in the power struggle. Um, the follow-up to this is something called the conscious relationship. And that's sort of where I perked up where I was like, so what are the skills? And you're like, it's communication skills and conflict resolution and emotional management. So, you know, I forget the names of the doctors. I want to say Hendrix and Marvel. I could be, I should look this up actually. It sounds really close. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. So, so you've heard of that concept before. Oh yes. And, and I don't. I don't necessarily disagree with it, but having had five children of my own and having worked extensively with parenting, I know I, I, I take a little bit of issue with the idea that parents, that kids come out whole and complete. Uh, I don't think that they're blank, but I, I, I know that my children came out with very, very forceful personalities. And then they needed to learn the skill set. I believe, and, and attachment theory bears this out from the evolutionary psychology perspective, that you are born and then your brain begins asking a question. Do I live in an extreme environment where I need to survive on my own? Or do I live in a luxurious, warm environment where the community will care for me? That's where we seem to divide between secure attachment or insecure attachment. And there's biochemicals that run along with this. There's the oxytocin uh, pathway, where if we are fulfilled and nurtured in childhood and, and develop extensive oxytocin with our mother, our father, our mirroring neurons activate based on their mood, based on their attention to us. If that activates, then we have high oxytocin. Our re oxytocin receptors stay oxytocin receptors. Then we generate GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, which then in turn generates things like melatonin. It allows us to sleep peacefully at night and it allows extensive bonding throughout adulthood. If we do not, if our parents don't give us that, the message received in our brain is I live in a severe extreme environment. Maybe the Danes have sailed up the coast and burned our village to the ground and we are all scrabbling for survival a thousand years ago out, out in the woods and there's not enough food. I will have to fight for survival most of my life. Things like sibling rivalry activates extensively at this point. I've seen that tear families apart because you will have to fight for resources. You'll also have to fight for resources in adulthood. It, it, you do, you do not activate the oxytocin pathways or at least not consistently. So then your oxytocin 
receptors often shift into vasopressin receptors at that point. Instead, you have low GABA, so a high cortisol flood throughout your system for most of your life. These are the avoidantly attached men who succeed amazingly in business. They're incredible founders. They're solo founders, usually. They're incredible executives, but eventually they burn out in... 40s, 50s, because they have no fulfilling relationships and they are wretchedly miserable at home, heavy drinking, trying to bring down their stress levels because they've never felt a fulfilling connection to another human being. So it, it is that fundamental question when a child is born, will I be loved and cared for or must I survive on my own power? That is that question. So that that's where I diverge from that theory quite a bit. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. So let's talk about self-esteem because it sounds like the, it's, a, it's a big piece of this, right? Which is building my self-esteem and how my self-esteem and my self-worth is affected. So um, how does self, uh, self-esteem self play into um, secure and insecure attachment? Absolutely. So self-esteem is tied in in two ways. Number one, if you have anxious attachment, you fundamentally believe there is something innately unlovable about you on the inside that everybody else is going to see if you ever open up. Your self-esteem is effectively in the negatives at this point, and you go out looking for validation for that belief. So everything you do wrong just deepens that belief. You also believe you are innately helpless and that you must be rescued. So you're endlessly looking for other people to do the things for you. When you hit a crisis, you are terrified that this is it. This is when you will show that you are worthless. You will not solve this problem. You are going to die in the wilderness. You will come through it, but then you just say, that must have been a fluke. I managed to survive somehow until you fix that anxious attachment style. All of this is fixable. Avoidant attachment, they typically run into relationships and they they don't have negative self-esteem, but they have very flat self-esteem. They say, I am going to try to be ethical and moral with other people, but nobody else will ever do that for me. So I have to survive. So they will often violate their own in-code, inner code of, of right and wrong and justify it saying everybody else would do worse if they got the chance. I had to do this to survive, but their self-respect diminishes. Those are the two ways I see people killing their self-respect through attachment issues. So what are some, 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 po- what are some positive ways we can build our self-esteem? Mm-hmm. The number one thing, when, when my coaching clients come to me and they say, Adam, I, am, I hate myself. I hate my life. I think that I am unworthy of love or I, I, just, I just don't respect myself in any way, shape or form. I set them down and here's the biggest impact I see right here is when I have them list out their three core defining principles that matter more than anything else to them. It might be honesty. It might be integrity, keeping your word, compassion with others, courage, right? Any of these number of things that you embody, many of them are ashamed because they violate these things. Someone else asks them to do something. They do it. They hate themselves for doing it. They now see that they violated this code or or they lied to stay safe or whatever it may be. So they rack up all this proof that they are not a good person. So I have them write down their three core principles that matter more than anything else. Then I start having them track that. In the morning, I have them set a phone reminder that says, I am a person of blank, blank, and blank. The research on this is fascinating. If you just say, I like these, or this, or just list them, or I will do these. No, you won't. The research says you maybe have a 30 to 40% chance of following through. If you make it part of your identity, I am a person of this, this, and this. The research says you have an 80% chance of following through. Then I have them write those three things on their bathroom mirror. So they're confronted by them every day. Write them on a piece of paper, stick them to your fridge. And then at the end of the night, here's the, here's the big part. Here's the really big part. You set a phone reminder on your phone that says, did I uphold my honor today? Or did I uphold my values today? Did I uphold my code today? And you sit and you reflect in the evening for about a minute or two. Did I? The point is not to beat yourself up. The point is to reflect, how did I make my decisions today? How did I choose? What did I choose? What should I choose differently? Then the next day, they go out. And when you hit a decision point, you ask yourself, what do my three principles have to say about this? You pause and you make a decision based on those instead of on the fear. When you do this, it's incredible how fast your self-esteem can turn around. I'm talking a matter of weeks if you follow through on this. Right. It's one of the things I teach, which is self-esteem is, is can, can swing up and down depending on, you know, environment, experience, situation, uh, that self-belief. 
I've also heard things like, um, you know, the, some of the ways to improve your self-esteem begins with that self-awareness, which I, which I hear you talking a lot, in, a lot about, which is really defining and writing these things down and putting them in front of you, doing the difficult things. It's called challenging oneself and then rewarding and recognizing that thereafter. Uh, emotional intelligence, or actually not so much emotional intelligence, emotional management is a really important tool for developing self-esteem. What about this whole concept of the why question? And I'll sort of, you know, preface this with once upon a time, we used to teach the why question. And as research has sort of progressed specifically in psychology, it's showing that the why question can actually be extremely self-defeating and destructive because it sends us down this, this spiral thinking, right? We could sort of go from one negative to the, ne uh, to, to the next versus using the what and the how question. So there's a couple parts to this. Is there truth to the why question being potentially more bringing me more down the, the, the negative spiral. And the second sort of piece of that is how important is language in all of this? You know, the, the, the words we use. Language is enormously important, but here's, here's where I think people get caught up is what is the purpose of the questioning? Whether it's a why question, the what, the how, what is the purpose behind it? Most people, they, they pick up a tip and they listen to a podcast, which is great keep listening. <laughs> uh, and they pick up tips and then they try to implement them, but they still have those self-defeating views in mind. They still say, this won't work because I am garbage. This won't work because no one will ever love me. It doesn't matter what I do because it's doomed. And then they embark on this, this journey of self-awareness and asking questions. And instead of saying, instead of really seeking the objective answers, they already have the innate bias about what is going to be the answer. So whether it's why or what, or how, the number one thing you've got to do is sit and start looking at the chain of events, whether that's a why or a what or a how, but the chain of events that led to decisions, for example, what led me to violate my code today? What was the feeling I felt where I felt compelled to do that? How can I change that variable so that in the future, I make the correct decision. Do I need to extend my decision-making process by 20 seconds? Do I hold my hand up to the other person and say, hold on, I want to tell you the truth, but I'm going to need a moment to think about the right way to say this, right? And, and we externalize our code so people see what we're doing and why. And then we pause and we breathe instead of telling a quick lie to get out of the pain. The pain is usually the vast majority of what drives us. And when people understand that the why is usually driven by pain or fear of pain, they can have a little bit of self self-kindness. So you have five kids. You're a busy guy. <laughs> All right. Busy, busy home. I'm assuming wide range of kids in regard to age groups. What are some best practices to contribute to secure attachment? Like, uh, for example, what do you do with the, the three to five year olds? What do you do with the seven to 10 year olds? What do you do with the, the, the tweens and the teenagers? Mm -hmm. It turns out, interestingly, that the same approach works across most of those age groups. It's just tailoring it to where they're at in their own cognitive development, the language that they can understand. So with little tiny toddlers and, and children who maybe are three to five, for example, in that window, talking to them about your love for them, reassuring them of your love for them. If you have to discipline, not punish, the very different things, but if you have to discipline, you explain why you are disciplining. You explain the goal of the discipline. You explain the lesson to them. You give them extensive chances and you explain the system so that they can make the choice for themselves of how they're going to choose to act. You walk them through it like you are an apprenticing, you're apprenticing them for adulthood. You don't treat a five-year-old like an adult, but you are acting as though you you are apprenticing them that way and teaching them lessons. And you explain that that's what you're doing. As they age, you continue to stack those lessons together, but you listen to them. And you can even say, how can I take care of you? What do you want from me? What makes you happy? What makes you feel loved? What What is your favorite thing? I ask my kids every day, what was your favorite part of today? And they tell me, and I say, why? Why was that your favorite part? And they explain. And I say, aha, would you like to do that more in the future so that we can feel close together? And they love it. And they absolutely love that. So working collaboratively with them, sharing that information with them. I'm not going to say co-parenting them together with the child, but, but understanding that you are working as humans to achieve a goal together, which is to build them into a healthy, thriving adult and explaining to them that that's what you're doing at every stage of the process. If you can do that and work with them, they can understand that others will work 
with them. And that's the key element of secure attachment. So I, I like what you said there, which is, you know, the difference between discipline and punishment, right? And just for the audience, I mean, how do you break that down simply? What is the difference? Or what would be an punishment, example of punishment versus discipline? Punishment is sometimes for convenience of the person who's punishing. It's to relieve the emotions of the person who's punishing. It's for satisfaction of the person who's punishing. It serves very little goal beyond make the behavior stop at any cost and or satisfy the person who is, who is doing the punishing. This is just hauling off and smacking your kids, screaming at your kids, guilt tripping your kids. Anything that down the road leads to long-term distress consequences for the sake of short-term convenience or just wrapping it up really quick because you don't have the time or the energy. Discipline is serving a purpose and it usually works with the other person to help shape behavior, but not as if they're a dog, shape the behavior with them and explain to them what you're doing and embrace them cognitively so that they can then take the lesson. And instead of fearing you and just learning to tiptoe around you, they learn to work with you and why this is an important behavior. And then you can teach them that way and, and encourage and reward them. Discipline often and it needs to be paired with rewards as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very smart, man. Super, super smart. Um, how, what is the age group of your kids, by the way? Just curious. Uh, so I have a newborn who is two weeks old and wow. Congratulations. I, my oldest is seven. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So it's been a really busy seven years, huh? Uh, every two years, they just kind of come along and it's well, just, how and it's going. are you going to have more kids or, or is this it? We will find Who, that out in the future. You. Okay. Good answer, man. Good answer. All right. So tell us a little bit about your coaching. So if like people are like, uh, the, if, 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 you know, a couple wants to come and, and do some work with you, um, what could they expect? What's the type of process and, and coaching you're going to put a couple through? And then let's sort of bridge into a little bit of leadership afterwards. Absolutely. So the number one thing that I have seen is that when you invest in yourself, it pays off for the next 50 years. Okay, so whatever you do, invest in yourself. Now, a skill set like communication, a skill set like conflict resolution, a skill set like being able to walk into any relationship and feel confident and feel at home. That's a skill set that will pay dividends for the next 50, 60 years. It's also what I call an heirloom skill. A lot of these have been lost in past generations for various reasons. We're bringing them back and we're handing them off to our children. So learning these skills is an investment in yourself and also in your legacy. I keep that in mind when people come into my coaching. I was a therapist for many years, but coaching is different. It's results driven. It's solution focused. If an athlete wants to break a record, they don't just go to a, a therapist to fix a medical problem. They go to a coach who has it will help them break that boundary. So help that's what I do. Better, it's play better, you know, fight better. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what coaching is designed for. So mine is results driven. It's very fast paced. It's for motivated individuals who want to grow quickly. They come in every level of brokenness. I have, I have people come in. Hey, Adam, I just had an affair. My wife just found out and we're thinking about getting divorced. She wants to divorce me. I want to marry. I want to remain them in the marriage. We also have a baby on the way. We have three other kids. What do we do? I walk in. I say, put your stress on my shoulders. I'm going to solve this for you. Do you think people are too quick to get divorced now because of conflict? Absolutely. Like it becomes the, the I'm throwing my hands up and it's, 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 yeah. they pull that trigger too fast. There's two divorces I see. Uh, one is the super fast divorce because they don't believe relationships are possible to save because they've never seen them get saved. I've seen that a lot. Uh, I also, I wrote this book behind my head, Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands, about the 20-year marriage gap, the 20-year divorce that happens. Uh, the man is avoidant, the woman is anxious, they make it work till they have kids, but then her hormones change and she starts wanting to protect the children and give them secure attachment. She now blames him for not being able to do that. The marriage starts to dissolve. She resents him. She's waiting for the kids to end high school so she can divorce him. 20 years and he has no idea what's happening. All of that 100% fixable. Every divorce is fixable if the couple is willing to do the work. I have taken couples from nightmare, edge of divorce, screaming at each other to fulfilled and loving and connected in a, a few sessions. It doesn't even take that long. Yeah. I like what you said there, which is it's all workable and manageable and we could all develop and we could sort of resolve through it. You know, that comes back to the whole Imago theory, which says that if you end your relationship in the power struggle, you were only doomed to create the new power struggle in the new relationship, right? And it's not that you stay in some of these relationships, but if you end the relationship, you end it not in the power struggle, you end it in the conscious relationship, which is 
built on communication, conflict, etc. This is where you see see people that are still able to maintain a healthy relationship afterwards, considering the fact that they've ended the marriage. Absolutely. If you can fix the beliefs from childhood and then mm. build the skill sets and then build the systems that lead to a fulfilling marriage over time, you can have an incredible relationship, even if you don't like each other right now. Yeah, it's very true. Hey, our parents fuck us up. <laughs> a little bit, right? A little bit. You know, no parent is perfect. Unfortunately, over the last hundred years, we've lost a lot of the parenting skills that were necessary. The family systems are broken. Through my work with attachment, I, I've I've looked at all five safety nets that were supposed to be there. They've all broken over the last hundred years. So we don't what even are have those parenting safety skills. Nets? Five safety nets. So originally we have the nuclear, what we call the nuclear family, right? Mom, dad, siblings, they are supposed to give us love and care. This is where we learn attachment from. But if that doesn't work, we are supposed to have the extended family system. Grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody around you. Next out, you have the kith and kin network. Your third cousin, twice removed, right? People marrying in. Your your local friends of family that are like almost like family, right? That network around you. Then you're supposed to have your tribe or your neighborhood or your group, whatever that local group is. And the fifth one is your religious connection, your religious community of whatever that may be. All five of those are supposed to be there and all five are now broken. So we have individuals growing up terrified and alone and then moving out into society to be terrified and alone. Then they get on dating apps to meet other people who are terrified and alone and try to build a romantic connection for life and build a healthy family and, and loving children. And it just, for some reason, isn't working. Fix the skill sets, bring those back, and then it works. Yeah. So, what? Are, what? Are, why do you think some of these are broken? Just, I mean, it's just the the way we've evolved, and it's just sort of you know things have gone no, so fast. No. I mean, you know, you know, so society goes through horrific periods where those things break and shatter. Right? I referenced the Danish attacks of the, of the one thousands, roughly eight hundred to twelve hundred, uh, the Dark Ages, all kinds of experiences when humans go through horrific societal challenges where they are split apart and broken, and their bonds are severed, and they they have to survive. This clicks on. For the last hundred years, we've had endless wars. We've had World War I killed like, and destroyed a generation physically and emotionally and mentally of young men. World War II, another generation of young men obliterated and lost and destroyed. Even those who survived came back with trauma. Those who didn't go to war but were here had to survive through the things like the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl here in the Americas, uh, all kinds of issues that we face, but just extensive societal collapse, social economic issues. All kinds of problems led to this extreme survival state of I will fight tooth and nail to keep myself and my family alive, but I won't be able to see them. The Industrial Revolution ripped families apart. Uh, the massive urbanization of families leaving their family networks and villages to live in cramped quarters in the city. And at the time, back in, in, the, in 1900, working... 80 to 100 hours a week. It wasn't until Ford came along and created the 40 hour work week, which kind of gave some of that back, but she got sued by the other entrepreneurs at the time for doing that. But we, we broke everything systematically and then it continued to get broken more, especially as the baby boomers came along and rejected all of the trappings and the expectations and responsibilities for what they felt was unfair. And they were given very little by parents who were afraid and hurt and screamed at them maybe or, or just barely survived. They came along and said, I want more than this. It's all about me, me, me. I have to survive. Then we got Gen X. We got the millennials. We've got everybody who's never even seen a healthy family system down to today where generation z is coming along saying nothing has ever worked five systems don't exist i'm alone i will rebuild in the rubble let me open tinder and find somebody to have sex with that's what we're looking at is a, a hundred years of decay and collapse man so you have kids i've got young kids i got a seven and a nine year old i mean what's the answer for them what's the answer for for them growing up and having healthy relationships and what's fascinating what's really fascinating is is gen z is eating up this attachment work so i'm on tiktok it's my biggest platform i'm on tiktok where gen z is starving to learn about better relationships they're starving to learn about attachment theory about skills they've missed they are so hungry to rebuild into something new it's incredible it's motivating so they are trying to rebuild millennials are coming along trying to rebuild a lot of my clientele tends to be in the millennial generation they are working diligently to find the answers and then hand those skills like i taught i said hand those skills to their children so that the next few generations will have the skills necessary 
necessary to rebuild those five structures that lead to secure attachment. I think we are in the process of a rebirth. We're in the process of a rebirth of positive classical masculinity, for example. We're in the rebirth of family. We're in the rebirth of attachment. I think the collapse has already happened. We're rebuilding from it now. Mm -hmm. Wow. The work you do is so important, my man. Thank you. Yeah, no, it really is. I think the world needs guys like you, which is what I like about what you're talking about is, is all of this shit that we've gone through. One, we can understand why. Two, there is light at the end of the tunnel. In other words, there is answer resources resolution to all of this. We don't have to become our upbringing. We don't have to be affected by some of our experiences. We have domain over that. We have control and choice, which I think is really important. And what I love about this is, is if we follow certain frameworks and tools, it's, it, we're going to get there, but the work is required for us to, to do, right? We really got to activate that stuff. hundred percent. The biggest piece of that work that I have found half of it is just even believing that there's a different way to live, even hearing about attachment, even hearing about relationships, even hearing you can change. You don't have to feel and believe this forever. Even just hearing that is groundbreaking for most people. Awesome. All right. Let me, um, let's for the audience, let's drop some of your information. If people want to come follow you on TikTok, if they want to hit you on some of the other platforms, if they want to come check out your bootcamp, drop some of the links. How do people get in touch with you? Absolutely. So my website is Adam Lane Smith, which houses my coaching, houses my attachment bootcamp video course that shows you the 10 step method for fixing your attachment. A lot of individuals take that, but what's fun is couples take it together. They talk about the material. It actually bonds you and heals your relationship as you fix your attachment together. I am on Twitter as at Adam Lane Smith. I'm on TikTok as at, at attachment bro for the younger crowd. I am on Instagram and YouTube as at attachment Adam. And I believe we're going to put the link to the bootcamp down in the show notes we sure are for the audience we're gonna have all of those links in the show notes and uh definitely i mean go check out adam's uh boot camp check out the website and uh i love your handle for tiktok bro <laughs> it's <is> awesome <laughs> that is amazing all right at the end of the episode we come to the most important question which is what do you think we could all do to be better humans tomorrow and and i'd like to frame that like better parents you know better kids better humans in general Learn how to live with secure attachment in your relationships so that you feel better and so that you show up better for everybody around you. Because when you are secure, everybody else can rely on you and it makes you so much safer for them to be around. That's awesome. Awesome. To the audience, man, Adam Lane Smith, go check him out. I think uh, if you have kids, if you are in a not just a marriage, but a long-term relationship, one of the things I learned a long time ago was don't wait until there's a problem. Go and do this as like a coaching exercise, right, Adam? Like it's not about waiting until things are really messed up. It's about um, you know, getting ahead of this. And it's kind of like the same way when you're, when you're going to have a kid, you go and you do baby classes and baby birthing classes and baby CPR classes. Cause you just, God forbid, you know, anything happens, at least you're prepared. And it's the same with relationships and relationships. I learned this a long time ago. If you're coming in to the relationship, 50%, it's a problem, right? Like you need to go into the relationship with 100% of yourself. Like you're 100% good. You're 100% secure. You're, you, you've developed these communication skills so you can add to this partnership because that's what relationships are, right? Partnerships. And it's how you show up in these cases. Adam, love the work that you're doing. Thanks for being here. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. All right. To the audience, if you like today's episode, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to share, and definitely go follow Adam Lane Smith, and we will see you next week. Yeah.